If you remember, um, last week we, uh, we left uh, Manet um, in, uh, in 1882 um, with his um, last great painting, The Bar at the Folies Bergère, um, uh, a painting that um, was admired because of the, um, the realism um, inherent in the choice of subject and the approach uh, to painting. Um, and you'll see that in the, um, in the video that I'm going to be showing you in just a moment as well. It's one of the last images they talk about. Um, this painting um, is um, also by um, Manet. It's called The Railway. Um, it's also called the Gare Saint-Lazare, or St. Lazarus uh, Station in Paris. Um, two of four paintings that Manet submitted to the Salon in 1874 were rejected. This one was accepted. He had been working on it since, um, uh, I've got 1866 on there. I'm going to change that right now. That's when I do copy and paste, and I apologize for that. I don't always see or change the date. There we go. Um, the painting is one that he had been working on for at least a couple of years. It represents um, a young woman seated um, with a little girl standing next to her with her back to us, who wears a very beautiful uh, dress. Uh, and they are actually in front of um, a low wall and an iron grate um, kind of fence. Uh, which separates them from a railway track, which is actually down below. You cannot see the train, but you can, in fact, see quite a bit of the smoke and steam coming up from a passing train, and that's what the little girl seems to be um, interested in. Um, it's a very unconventional painting, first of all, that one of the major subjects has her back to us, right? So she is um, anonymous. And, and also, I hope that you notice that model, um, the woman, that is the same woman who had posed for Manet for Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe and Olympia. That's Victorine Murand, M-E-U-R-E-N-D. I will never ask you that on a test, but just in case you want to know. This was the largest painting that Manet had uh, done up to this time, either wholly or in great part, out of doors, en plein air. It is evidence of his having been influenced by a younger group of painters whom he had come to know, called the Impressionists. In particular, under the influence of the younger Claude Monet, Manet was using a brighter, heightened palette of colors. The critics jumped on this work, one critic describing it as two mad women attacked by incurable Manet mania watch a passing train through the bars of their padded cell. Again, what I would say to you about that quote is that the critics are making no effort to begin to come to terms or to understand um, what um, this generation of artists is attempting to do. It is during Manet's lifetime that the Impressionist movement is beginning to develop, again, with this group of young painters who are very much interested in painting en plein air, knowing of the generations before them, the traditions of painting of landscape of Courbet, of the Barbizon uh, school. These artists are fascinated with the potential of how we perceive and how light in fact, in an open-air um, uh, environment, changes everything that we think that we see. Um, they were fascinated um, in literally um, looking differently at the world, and they felt that you had to do it directly out of doors and not bring your subject inside and then attempt to manicure it. And there's that term again that I've used so often. In broad terms, Impressionism should be understood as, in essence, the final stage of realism in France in the 19th century. In many ways, it reflects on positivist, scientific attitudes of mid-century. 
We know that it's during this period that were, there were increasing scientific studies of optics and an interest in psychological principles of visual perception. These were being investigated. Studies were being done about color. And these artists were interested in all of this. Manet was admired by this young generation um, of artists. Uh, and um, he um, uh, was certainly also um, to influence them. We know that Monet and Renoir in particular owed a great deal to Manet's freer brush stroke and his habit also of painting directly on a white canvas rather than priming the canvas with a darker color and then bringing the light into it. Uh, Manet was actually painting on a light uh, canvas and of course as we know from last week he had spent um, much of his career eliminating value gradation, literally moving from one uh, dark tone to a lighter tone right next door to it. In the summer of 1874, Manet went to Argenteuil. I will spell it for you. Capital A-R-G-E-N-T-E-U-I-L. Argenteuil. A R G E N. T-E-U-I-L. Again, this is the summer of 1874. He went there because he wanted to visit Claude Monet, who had been living there for a couple of years. Monet, who uh, did not have much money, had fitted out a floating houseboat, a floating studio, an idea he adopted from a knowledge of Daubigny, if you remember, was one of the Barbizon painters who started working on a houseboat. And Monet was floating on the Seine River, painting, as we can see, from Manet's own painting of Monet on his studio boat. Is that confusing enough for you? Um, this is the work of Manet. Um, you will, there is a joke at one point in the video, and it'll go quickly, but I just want to let you in on it. Uh, the fact is, um, Monet began to find some success at the Salon, and um, these were for his. Uh, this was for his landscapes. This is early in his career, and we know that <clears throat> Manet continued to not have success, to have his works rejected. And um, a story is told that at one point, um, a couple of um, compatriots of Manet came up to him and congratulated him heartily on the two paintings that had been received at the Salon, that they were terrific and wonderful. And, and he basically said, what the hell are you talking about? And then he was told this was an artist named Monet. And he was furious. You know, he wanted Monet to change his name. It's a difference of one letter. You, of course, will never get confused over the names of those two artists because you remember that Manet came first and A is the first letter in the alphabet. There's no other way you can do it. That's, that's an easy way. Monet is the next um, generation, the younger generation. Um, the Salon of 1873 had been so hostile in terms of the jury rejecting a works um, that um, uh, another Salon des Refusés was set up. You remember we've seen this before, about 10 years earlier. But now this solution was considered absolutely untenable, unsatisfactory, for a new generation of artists who did not want to have their works associated with the stigma of refusal or to have their works associated with works that should have been refused when they felt theirs um, should not. Thus, in a spirit of Courbet's pavilion of realism and at the instigation of Claude Monet, 39 artists participated in an independent exhibition that ran from April 15th to May 15, 
Um, it is no um, unusual or uh, uh, specific um, fact that we, we should forget here, and that is that um, the first Impressionist exhibition was held in the studio of a photographer, a very famous French photographer, Félix Nadar, N-A-D-A-R. I believe he was vacating uh, that studio for another one. I make this point here because it's important, and I will be bringing it out on Wednesday. The impression, and they don't bring it out at all, interestingly, in the video. There's a lot they can't bring out because uh, they try to get through it, um, so much material, um, is that the Impressionists and the way that the Impressionists see is not only dependent on their working out of doors and scientific theories, but also the influence of photography. Photography is invented, you remember, in 1837, 1839. By the 1870s, photography is beginning to have an impact um, on, um, on painting. So, in any case, um, we have 39 artists who uh, get together uh, to show their works. Among them, Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Camille Pissarro, Berthe Morisseau, Auguste uh, Renoir. Uh, and um, Pissarro had to persuade Degas and Monet to allow the work of one artist to be shown because all of the Impressionists thought this artist was crazy and thought his work was too strange and really they didn't want to be associated with his, with his work. But they con he convinced, Pissarro convinced Degas and Monet, and we're going to talk about Pissarro on Wednesday because they don't even mention him in the video. That artist that they didn't want to be associated with was Paul Cezanne. It was presented as a group exhibition, the Anonymous Society of Artists, Painters, Sculptors, and uh, Printmakers. Um, it received the name by which we know it uh, today as the first Impressionist exhibition um, a few days after the opening, when a critic referred to this painting by Claude Monet, Impression Sunrise, 1872, uh, as the um, crown, I don't know if you'd want to call it the crowning glory, but the work by which all of the other works um, should be measured. Um, in other words, a disaster. He called it the exhibition of impressionists. Now, if you think about that word, impression, that's the last thing that you should show as a final work if you are an academic painter, right? An impression. Uh, might be said to be parallel to a sketch, for instance. It's not a finished work. And this work, um, Impression Sunrise, 1872, is characteristic of the Impressionists. It's their attempt to view nature directly, not to reproduce it photographically or graphically or realistically. It's not even close to the works of the Barbizon School. And you remember what um, uh, criticism the Barbizon painters were receiving about their landscapes. Um, this is literally a kind of illusion um, of um, a harbor uh, painted with the emphasis on light um, and atmosphere. Subject matter, especially emphasizing contemporary life, was important to all of the Impressionists, um, as was the study of light and color. Certain scientific advances in the field of optical research, especially of what constitutes color, as well as what constitutes the structure of light. You know, of course, that light um, is the pres means the presence of color. Without light, there is no color. There's a spectrum of light that comes out of, uh, of white light um, specifically. And the Impressionists were increasingly interested um, in the optical research that was being done um, in the field of color. By the way, um, color is still one of the most subjective um, of, um, of elements that is used by um, artists even today. Um, I keep thinking back to a study that was done maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago by the federal government. They were trying to figure out what's the best color to paint the inside of a submarine. 
Is that a good question? I mean, if you're going to have people who are down there for weeks or months, what's the best color? Because, again, color works differently for, uh, for different people. And so they, you know, they did an entire study. So we're still trying to figure out um, how to use color. The scientist who's usually associated with the Impressionist theories on color is Eugene Chevreul. And I've given you his name here at the bottom of this slide. He was a French chemist who published a book, The Principles of Harmony and Contrast of Colors and Their Application to the Arts. It was published in 1839. <clears throat> he had a number of theories about color and how it could be used. His principal thesis was that colors in proximity to each other, that is, Colors that are close to each other will influence and modify how you perceive them. They'll modify each other. He also investigated what's known as optical mixture, which is going to be something taken up by one of the post-impressionist artists, um, Georges Seurat, optical mixture in which he showed that two colors set side by side will appear to be a single color when viewed from a distance. In other words, you get optical mixture. Your eyes do the work uh, for you. In fact, it was Chevreul's theory of optical mixture that eventually led the Impressionists to begin to tin shadows with colors complementary to the color of the object casting the shadow to begin trying to put into practice some of his theories um, and um, ideas. Using clear, bright colors and almost eliminating black from their palettes, the Impressionists began to achieve remarkably brilliant effects with their characteristically short, choppy brush strokes that so accurately captured the feeling of the movement of light as it reflects off of different surfaces. The fact that at close range, their paintings such as Impression Sunrise by Monet um, uh, looked unintelligible and that the forms only seemed to come together if you were at a certain difference um, was not um, important to them. But of course, there was tremendous adverse criticism uh, about um, these sloppy uh, paintings that were being um, uh, forced onto the public as finished works. The leader of the movement was Claude Monet. I show you uh, Monet in self-portrait from 1886. And on the right-hand side, um, a photograph, um, 1899. That 1886 cannot be right. I'm going to check that. I apologize. Monet was born in 1840, so I would say it's probably 1866 that we're looking at for the self-portrait on the left. Monet was born in Paris, but he was raised in the port city of Le Havre on the English Channel. All right, so he was, he was brought up um, by the sea. Le Havre is two words, capital L-E, and then another word, capital H-A-V-R-E. It is still a major port on the English Channel in France today. He grew up in Le Havre. He was initially trained uh, there, studying briefly with a seascape and landscape painter named Eugène Boudin. I show you a work by... Monet's first teacher, Boudin. This is from about 1865. Boudin um, had, um, all, uh, had also been known by an earlier generation um, of painters, um, and that would include those associated with the Barbizon school. Um, he, uh, in fact, is the one who told Monet that everything that is painted directly on the spot has a strength and power, a vividness of touch that one does not find again in the studio. 
He is hearing from his first teacher that he needs to be outside. He needs to be en plein air. This is, of course, still a very um, progressive approach uh, to painting at this time um, in the 1860s. But in fact, um, it is something that Boudin uh, propounded, becoming an, a painter um, on, on the out of doors, en plein air. Monet went to Paris in 1859 to continue his studies. He was going to be a landscape painter. He studied at two different ateliers. His studies were interrupted once for military service. He served in Algeria. And then in 1865, he exhibited for the first time in the Salon two seascapes, which were quite successfully received. And this is just about the point where um, Manet is complimented on, on his wonderful uh, seascapes. So uh, this may not be one of the specific paintings um, that was exhibited at the Salon, but it's from the same period of time. This is Monet's Coast at Sainte Adresse from 1864. Again, he exhibited it for the first time in the Salon in 1865. So I've, uh, I've now uh, given you a little bit of background on Impressionism, some of which is not covered um, in the video, uh, a little bit uh, more extensive background on Monet and how we got him um, to Paris. And now I'd like to, um, to show you the video. Let's see how it goes.